You guys having a good time? Yeah. All right. Hey, you can take a seat real quick. And uh, thank you, sir. What a day it has been. Amen. You know, we have uh, celebrated in singing. We've celebrated with the Lord's Supper and baptism. And I just got to say this to you, BT. You guys know how to show up for a party. Not only are we out of seats in this room, we're out of seats in our overflow room also. And, uh, yeah. If you are standing, I am sorry we don't have a seat for you, but I am very glad you're here. And uh, I promise you next year, next year we'll make sure and we'll have more seats. How about that? We do have a few up in the front. I know sometimes it's, you know, you think people in the front are going to bite, but they don't bite too hard. And so if you want to come down, I see a handful of seats. And if you have seats next to you, if you could scoot in a little bit, we do have quite a few people standing. Welcome to everyone today. Welcome to those of you in our overflow room, uh, those of you watching online. So thankful that you are tuned in with us this Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful to see our plus ones today. You may be thinking, who's that? That's all of the guests today. That's right. I'm so glad you, you are our VIP. I'm so honored that you're with us and that you would say yes to an invitation. So thank you for being here, guests of VT. Let me do a quick exercise. I don't have a bunch of time. But, but as Pastor Nick has been saying, we're now one church in two locations, five services. So let's just kind of see where everybody is. And so if you regularly attend McAllen Campus Saturday night, let me hear from you real quick. McAllen Saturday night. What about McAllen 9 a.m.? McAllen 9 a.m. McAllen 11 a.m. What about, what about Sherryland 11? Sherryland 11. And Sherry Land, 1 o'clock. All right. Hey, you probably heard someone close to you just go crazy. And so take one minute, turn around, shake somebody's hand, say Happy Easter, and you're glad they are here for BT Church Easter service. All right, took too long. Let's go. You know, it has been a day of celebration. Lots of energy went into this, and I want to say thank you to our amazing group of volunteers that helped with this, our amazing worship and production crew, absolutely, our ministry staff, and I want to say thank you to the amazing people of the McAllen Convention Center for working with us to have this day become a reality. It has been, I see Mike Dennis, how long has it been since BT was in one service, Mike? Do you know? 20 years? Don't ask Mike. All right. It's been a long time, and so it's been a day of celebration. We're going to keep celebrating for a few, min few minutes in God's Word. But I want to take time and hit the pause button because while we celebrate today the new life that Jesus has secured for us, I want to be intentional to remember the price that it cost to allow us to celebrate. You see, that first Good Friday that we celebrate because it gives us life. It costs Jesus everything. And today, all of us have come together, some pushing 3,000 people here. And we've come together from lots of different places, lots of backgrounds, and we're all over the spiritual map, if we're honest. But what we have to know is that Jesus has secured a life for us, and he's secured a future and a hope for us. But the cost of securing that was his life, and so I want to start our time on this exciting day of celebration, reading to you, and just listen, or some of you, you're like, Bible drill, you want to, don't open the Bible yet, just listen to this narrative, so that our hearts can be ready for the celebration, listen to the narrative of what it cost Jesus to allow us to celebrate today. This is John 19, and this is the record of his crucifixion. And it says, so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. 
And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. Also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her in his own home, And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to its mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we've gathered to celebrate the resurrected Lord, King Jesus, God, as we've come together rejoicing what you've done in our lives and some people today rejoicing what you're going to do today, Father, I pray that in all of the celebration we would be mindful of the fact that you gave everything to give us this life. That Jesus, you stepped out of heaven into earth and you walked a sinless life. And as an innocent man, you faced charges that were false and you went to be executed on that cross, suffering in anguish, taking my place so that I could have yours. And so, Jesus, I thank you today as we gather together. I'm thankful for each person, and Jesus, I'm thankful that you did all the work necessary to make me your plus one for eternity, that you reserved my spot in heaven. May we celebrate that today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I want to do today is as we remember the death of Jesus And as we remember the suffering he went through, and most of us know that story, and there's a lot of details not in what I read, the the fact that he was nailed to that cross after being beaten almost to the point of death, that he would have been beaten and scourged so badly that most of the flesh from his back and even from his front would have been torn off, and as he would hang on the cross, pulling himself up for air, that open wound would scrape against the wood, The, the suffering and the anguish, as we have that in mind, We've come to celebrate that he secured a place for us for eternity. And in that passage I read in John 19, there's a word that sticks out to me above all else, and it's the word finished. You see, in verse 28, it says that when Jesus knew everything was finished, it was then that he gave up his spirit. After Jesus knew that everything that needed to be done was taken care of, when everything that needed to get finished was finished, Jesus gave his life up. And what that tells me, beloved, is that Jesus is a finisher. And don't we live in a society where a lot of us start things and don't finish it? Can I get an amen from the ladies on that honeydew list, right? Sorry, guys. Right, when we start things, and when we start so many things, so many things in our life, they, they, they stay unfinished. And some people in this room right now or in overflow or online or standing somewhere, some people, you have unfinished spiritual business because you keep trying to do it yourself. But what I want you to hear this morning and what we celebrate today is that we're not the finisher Jesus is. That's why we call it the finished work of Jesus on the cross, right? But so what, right? I know how it goes, especially those of you that maybe your guests, you're like, you know, you talk all preacher-like, but what does that mean? I get it. Okay, Jesus is a finisher, but so what? How does that affect my life? I'm glad you asked. What does it mean? I, I want to talk for just a few minutes about what it means that Jesus is a finisher. For a lot of us in this room, we've come to know that personally because we've received the finished work of Jesus in our life. But for some of us today, for some of us today, we know there's something more to this life And if you'll listen for just a few minutes, I want to tell you what it is, all right? I want to talk about how Jesus, the finisher, 
affects our lives, the implications of what it means that Jesus finished all he needed to do. And so I'm going to look at Romans chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. The text will be on the screen. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 6. I'm going to look at verses 3 through 11. And real quickly, we're going to look at what does it mean that Jesus is a finisher. And so in Romans 6, I'm going to start in verse 3, and this is what it says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And if you don't read the Bible much, that sounds real churchy, and I get it. What this guy named Paul is saying is that when we align our lives with Jesus, the finisher, Jesus allows us not to, not to just share in the, the work of his death, but to share in the power of his resurrection. And so here back to the text, it tells us that we've been freed from sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, so you also, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so what does that mean for us today? I just want to share three things with you. No matter where you are on the spectrum. You know, some of us, if we're honest, we say, you know, I'm glad to be at Easter and I brought somebody and I brought the person who needs to hear about Jesus. But, but some of us here, you're at church every Sunday and you think that Easter is maybe your Sunday off, right? Or he's going to talk about the cross again. We're going to talk about salvation again. Let me tell you, there's not a person listening to me that doesn't need to hear about the cross again. There's not a person here that doesn't need to hear about the work of Jesus Again, we need to be reminded because in this life, even those of us that are believers, we get discouraged, amen? Anybody ever get discouraged? We, we get down and we have difficult days and it's those difficult days that we cling not to how good we are or cling to how good the world is or cling to how good our financial situation is or the political climate. It's when we get down that those of us that have trusted Jesus, we cling to him because he's the one who's finished it. And so based on these verses in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 11, I think there are three things that stick out to me that are so appropriate for an Easter celebration. You see, what that text tells me in verses 3 through 8, all that talk about, you know, if, if we've been united with Jesus, we've been, been buried with him in the baptism of his death, and, and we've been raised to walk in newness of life, and we've been set free from sin, no longer slaves to sin. All those verses, verses 3 through 8, that kind of confusing text, ultimately what it's telling me is that Jesus the finisher has paid my debt. Did you catch that? Jesus the finisher. He's paid my debt. He's paid your debt. If you've been around church for a while, you know we say that a lot, right? Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe, and I owed a debt what? That I couldn't pay, right? It's been in songs. Every preacher uses it. But even though it's become somewhat cliche, it's completely true. Every person in this room was born into debt. Every person had a debt or maybe still has a debt. And this is the bad thing about the debt of sin. I can never pay it. I'm incapable of paying my, my sin debt. And this is what breaks my heart. Now listen to me because this is for some of us. There are so many people that believe this in churches. And there are so many churches that teach it. And I promise you this, if you're new to BT, we'll never teach this. Too many people believe this and too many churches teach this, that if you just work hard enough, you chip away that debt, right? You just start your, your sin debt snowball and you pay off the small debts first. And if you just keep working at it, you just keep doing enough, whatever it is, depending on the church, if you just keep saying the right prayers, if you just keep reading the Bible, if you keep showing up, if you get baptized again, if you give enough, if you just keep doing this list, 
then you're going to position yourself to one day balance the scales. Beloved, it's impossible. That's why Jesus is necessary. Hear me, I spent a good portion of my life trying to pay that debt. And what breaks my heart is that there are countless people that live their lives trying to pay a debt they can't pay. And Jesus has paid it, they just haven't received payment. And so people go through life trying to chip away at a debt, hoping that when they stand before God in eternity, because this life is not all there is, that when they stand before God, they would have done enough to have that debt balanced. But I'm telling you that when people show up before God in eternity, hoping they balance the debt on their own, they will find that they stand before God with an unsettled debt. And so Jesus, by allowing us to be baptized with him in in his death and allowing us to be raised to walk in newness of life, Jesus freeing us from sin so we no longer have to live as slaves to that temptation, to that emptiness. What does he do? He pays a debt for us. But you know what's amazing? It doesn't stop there. You see, it's not just that he pays a debt for us. If you look at verses 9 and 10, he cancels our collection. See, Jesus, the finisher, he cancels our collection. Now, some of you don't know what that means, and that's good. That means you've always paid your bills on time. Sadly, I have to be honest, in my adult life, I have found myself in that position once or twice. You know what that means? You ever, you ever had a debt, and you, you couldn't pay it for whatever reason, and you got behind on the debt? Maybe, maybe it was a medical bill, and you, owe, you owed XYZ Hospital a certain amount of money, and you just couldn't pay it, right? And so XYZ Hospital, they send you bill after bill after bill. But when you don't pay, eventually, three, four, five, six months later, you don't just get bills from XYZ Hospital anymore, do you? No, because they turn your account over to collections. And so now you get letters and phone calls from XYZ Hospital, and you get letters and phone calls from Break Your Thumbs Collection Agency, right? (laughs) Right, you know what I mean? You've seen Rocky, right? You know, work in the docks. And so now your account, it's not just that you got a debt, now you're in collection. In verses 9 and 10 of Romans 6, what it tells us here, listen to these words again, verse 9, it says, We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion. Hear me, death at one time had a level of dominion over Jesus because he gave it so. See, Jesus did physically die, right? Right? He he died, he gave up his spirit, his body was placed in a tomb. But guess what? He didn't let death have the final word. Because 2,000 years ago, Easter Sunday, you know what he did? He walked out of the tomb. He got up, he left the death clothes behind, and he walked out of the tomb. And guess what? He's not going to die again. He died one time, verse 9. Verse 10 tells us, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. What does that mean? That means that he cancels collection. He turns it over. It's not just that Jesus pays the debt. Hear me. It's not just that he pays the debt for us. He cancels collection. He calls the collector and says, guess what? You know, Chris had that debt. He had that debt. He couldn't pay it. He got behind and you were calling him at his door. But guess what, collector? I've canceled the debt. And you know who the collector is, by the way, for sin? It's death. It's death. Every person who places trust in anything but Jesus stands condemned. And any person who goes from this life to the next without receiving the payment of their sins through Jesus Christ and having Jesus cancel their collection account, they stand before God. And I believe with, with, with a heavy heart, God says to them, you can't come here. You have to depart from my presence. There's, there's not a place for you. I, you didn't receive the plus one invitation because you trusted something other than me. And so Jesus pays our debt, but then he cancels collection. And so when you trust Jesus, guess what? That, that physical death may still come. All of us have death in front of us, right? But when you trust Jesus... It's just like Jesus' death. It doesn't have dominion over you. Dominion is a fancy word that means authority or power. You will breathe your last breath. You're like, wow, this is an encouraging sermon. I'm glad I came. 
All of us will breathe our last breath physically. But for the Christian, for the person who has trusted Jesus Christ alone, when you breathe your last physical breath, you will find yourself in eternity face to face with Jesus. And in many ways, life will just be beginning. He cancels our collection account. And so death loses its sting forever. But this is where it gets good. You ready for the good part? There's like 2,800 people and no one's excited for the good part. Here we go. Listen to verse 11 one more time. So you also must consider, or some Bibles say reckon, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is where it gets good. Because what verse 11 is telling me, it's not just that he paid my debt. Now you catch that? Jesus pays the debt he doesn't owe. He pays a debt I owe and I cannot pay in any way. And so it's not just that he pays the debt, and it's not just that he cancels collection, which, by the way, how amazing would that be? Those of you that have ever, and I know, you know, we don't want to talk about it, but those of you that have ever been in that situation, you've, you've come on financial hardship, right? How amazing would it have been if someone would have stepped into your life when you had debts and collectors, and they would have paid all your debts and canceled all your collections, and they would have told you, here's the deal, I've paid all of your debts off. You don't, you don't owe me anything. I've paid all your debts. I've called the collections agencies. They know that your debts have been paid. And if that person said to you, you're back to zero. Now just see if you can keep it above the water from here. Those of us that have been, how amazing would that have been, right? For someone to say, I've paid your debt. I've canceled your collections. You're at zero. Just see if you can stay in the black now. Just see if you can not get back into that situation. And we would like to think, oh, I'm not going to get back into that situation. I know better now. But you know what? Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't just pay a debt. And doesn't just cancel collections and say, you know, you know what, Nick? I paid your debt and I canceled your collection. And so from this day forward... You're right here, man. And so it's your responsibility not to get back here, right? He doesn't do that. He pays our debt. He cancels our collection. And then he puts our name on his account. Do you catch that? He, 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 March 4th, 1998, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, he paid all of my debts. He canceled all of my collection accounts. And then he put my name on his account, if you will. And so it's not just the person with limitless resources gets you back to zero. They say, guess what? I'll make sure you're never on the wrong side of things again because it won't be your account that we're looking at. It will be my account. You know what that means? Listen to me. We become joint account holders with God. That's amazing. And so what happens is we receive Jesus not by any work, not by a baptism. We celebrate baptisms because they demonstrate that someone's already trusted Christ. So it's not through some work, baptism, giving, attendance, prayers. It's through acknowledging Jesus as my Savior because I need him and I can't do it alone. And he pays all of my debts and he cancels all of my accounts. He says, Chris, I love you, but I know you and you can't keep it here on your own. So let me put your name on my bank account so that when the time comes and people want to know if you have enough money in the bank, they just look at mine. And beloved, hear me, his account is never out of resources. You know why some of us in this room live defeated lives? You've trusted Jesus as your Savior, and I'm not trying to be mean. Hear me, I've been there. You've trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you're facing a hardship, and you're letting the hardship dictate your life and your joy, thus dictate your misery, because somewhere along the way, you don't doubt that Jesus saved you by grace. You just don't believe that he's keeping you by grace. And somewhere, this is what happens to us as believers because Satan wants to attack our identity. Somewhere along the way, and this is why Easter's for everyone, by the way. Somewhere along the way, we lose sight of the fact that it's Jesus' account. And we start thinking that to get through this life, we got to write checks ourselves. I know checks are like an antiquated thing of the past, right? You find them in museums. Now, do y'all remember checks, right? If you have a check, right, in the top left corner of the check, it's got your name, right? Because you're the account holder. 
So my checkbook on the top left corner will say, Mr. Christopher and Christy Dupree, our address and all that stuff. You put the date, you, you, you fill in the amount, you sign it, and there's that critical line that says, that says pay to the order of, right? And so somewhere along the way, as believers, or some of you that are unbelievers, you think this is the case, you think you've got to rely on the checks that have your name in the top left. But if you're here as a believer living a defeated life, that's not what he intended. That's baloney right there. He didn't intend to save you and pay your debts and cancel your collections just so you could go back to misery. He came to give you life to the fullest. And you need to look into your your mind and that, that imagination you have. And you need to look at that check. And you don't need to picture your name in the top left corner. In the top left corner, it says, The God Almighty, Most High, King Jesus, Ancient of Days. Pick the name that you like for God. And he's already signed the bottom of the check. You want to know where your name is? It's on pay to the order of. Pay to the order of. He has paid the price for life to the fullest. Believers, we don't need to go through life defeated. We have extremely difficult days. But Jesus got up and walked out of that tomb so that we could walk with him. You know, let me try to explain it this way. We're about to wrap up. This coming Tuesday, little, little you know, announcement here in case you didn't know. This Tuesday is my birthday, April 18th. I accept cash. I don't do checks. I'm, I'll evict cash is off the no. Yeah, this, 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 this Tuesday will be my, my 38th birthday. And uh, my favorite dessert by far. Now, don't, now, 2,800 people don't need to make me this, all right, because that would be overwhelming. But my favorite dessert by far is cheesecake. I got any cheesecake lovers in the house? You know, I'm going to do a little visual to help, help this illustration work. So I need someone, Juan. I saw you first. Come on, Juan. Give it up for Juan Contreras, our middle school pastor, and BT Sherry Land. Come on up here. So like I said, Tuesday is my birthday. Cheesecake is by far my favorite dessert. I am hoping and praying that maybe someone in the room that I'm married to will provide me. That's only one person, by the way. Uh, will provide me with some cheesecake. Amen? Can I get an amen to the cheesecake? All right. I'm just saying. A whole bunch of people just agree with me, Christy. And, and so here comes one, and look at this. We even have cheesecake on the platform. This is amazing. What a day this is. You know, all right, brother? It's a pretty good day, huh? It's quite the party. They look good. They look good? <laughs> now, now, I got two amazing-looking cheesecakes here. This is something else. Did you make that just for me? I did, just for you. Now, now we have two pieces of cheesecake. I'll say this, one is not homemade, and one is homemade. And so I'm going to let you decide for all of us which one's the best one. And so here is exhibit A. Just just go ahead and take a bite there. You all wish I'd have picked you now. (laughs) What do you think? That's pretty good, right? Yeah. All right. This one's a little smaller. But it's a nice triangle. It's got some strawberries on it. Looks the same, more or less, right? Give that one a taste. See what you think. <laughs> Man, that's the homemade one, bro. Really? Yeah, what, what, what was wrong with that one? <laughs> it tasted um, like buttery. Or that one something. tasted like butter? That's yeah. because that is butter <laughs> with strawberries on top. Hey, y'all give it up for one. Take a drink, man. Appreciate it. Now, I know you can't see them from down, but, but these two desserts, they're about to take them away, but they look exactly the same. They both have an amazing graham cracker crust. They have strawberry drizzle on top. They are both the same color, the same texture, the same thickness. But there was one very critical difference as Juan spit out the second one. My wife made that, bro. You heard her feelings. No. The second one, guess what? It wasn't cheesecake. It was whipped like the tub butter. My wife got a tub of butter and made it look like a cheesecake. (laughs) But Juan, you didn't know that till you tasted it, did you? And so do you see where I'm going with this? 
They looked exactly the same. They had a lot of the same characteristics, the crust, the topping, the, 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 the texture and consistency. There was only one key difference, and it was the ingredients. It was what actually was on the inside of the cake that set them apart. And beloved, you need to hear this. Jesus pays debts and he cancels collections and he puts people's name on his account, not so that the external can look the part, but so the internal can be transformed for all of eternity. And there are too many people. There are too many people, most likely in this room, you come all the time, maybe you got invited and it's your first time, but there are too many people hoping that looking like cheesecake will be enough. And I don't say this to scare anyone, I say this because I genuinely love you. If you have all the looks but the ingredients are all wrong and you're hoping that will be enough, one day you will stand before a holy God and when he tastes that, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. Because it's not about looking the part. It's not about even doing the part. It's about being found in Jesus. You know, as I wrap up, this past week my wife and I went to the mall with our four children. That's an adventure always. And yes, thank you for commending me. And it was one of those painful parent moments, you know, the ones I'm talking about that some of you, you always tell me, they grow up so fast. It was one of those they grow up so fast moments. We were at the mall, and we were at the part of the mall where the merry-go-round is. The car- I don't know where it is, all right? This is what I know about La Plaza Mall. I know how to park at Dillard's and get to the food court, right? <laughs> Out of that, it's above my pay grade, but... But we're at, the, we're at the merry-go-round, you know, the big carousel with the horses, and all four of my kids, they want to ride the merry-go-round. So we pay for them all to ride the merry-go-round. I have to ride it because I have a four-year-old, and they don't let him on his own. And so, you know, the merry-go-round, you get on, there, there are some horses, and they go up and down, and there are some horses, and they, or are some carriages, and they spin, and there are some things that just sit still and do nothing, and that's for the lame, non-adventurous kids. But anyways, this is what happened this week. All four of my kids get on the merry-go-round, and my oldest son, who's 10 now, he's officially reached the age where the merry-go-round is not cool anymore. You know, like the horse doesn't go that high, actually. And it doesn't even spin that fast, right? And no matter how hard I try, I can't pass the girl in front of me in this horse race. In fact, the highlight of the ride is when you come around and there's mom with the, with the cell phone, hey, mom. Right, and you come back around, same picture, mom. I'm so over this, mom, right? And so we got done with the merry-go-round, and he told me, he's like, yeah, that was kind of lame. I was like, "Mm." And beloved, hear me. There's so many of us that have trusted Jesus as our Savior and so many of us that have never trusted him as our Savior. But we're going through life on that merry-go-round. And one time it was awesome. The ups and downs, round and round, mom taking pictures, and it was all there was to life. But now you find yourself, especially those of you that you know in your heart you've never trusted Jesus, somewhere along the way, the merry-go-round just seemed to get lame. And you're going through life, and it's your marriage, and it's your work, and it's your finances, and it's vacation, and it's all the things that you hoped would give you the fullness of identity that only Jesus can give you. And you're riding the merry-go-round of life, and you're just asking yourself, there's got to be something more. You're right, there is. Jesus is the more. And if you've trusted Jesus, you need to understand this. Don't go back and settle for something less. And if you have hoped in everything but Jesus, guess what? Today, you have a chance to find life eternal. Maybe someone, some friend, some co-worker, some family member, some neighbor, some stranger before the past few weeks invited you today and you received that invitation and you're here. And let me tell you why you're here. Jesus brought you here so he can save you. He brought you here so he can call you out by name. But you've got to respond. He's paid the debts. He's canceled collections. He just hadn't transferred your name to his account because you haven't said yes to him yet. And some of you here, maybe you're in overflow. This is what it's all been about. 
you've been longing for the more of life, and I'm telling you that there is more, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so this is what I want to ask us to do today. We're about to wrap up. I'm going to ask everyone to just bow your head and close your eyes, just for a minute. Everyone across the room, just bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to talk to you, and I want you to open your ears and listen if this is you. There are some people in this room, I know for a fact God's confirmed it in my heart. You've been invited here. You've been at BT for years or another church. I don't know your background, but here's the truth of the matter. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I've been speaking of this new life that Jesus gives. And you know that you know nothing of it. You've been hoping to balance the scales of eternity with your good deeds. The truth is your heart has no certainty of what eternity has for you. And I want you to hear this, you can have certainty today. You don't have to go another minute without knowing exactly who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And for some of us here right now, Jesus called you by name and he brought you here so he can save you right here at the McAllen Convention Center. April 16th, 2017. He's waiting for you to receive the gift of eternal life. And so listen to me. If you don't know where you stand with Jesus Christ, if you don't know that you've ever trusted him as your savior, if you don't know that you've received the gift of eternity, if in your heart you're uncertain what what the future has for you, if you don't know if you're going to be in heaven forever or separated from God in hell forever, and it worries you and it scares you, I'm telling you, Jesus came so you could know. And I don't want you to leave today not knowing. So I just want to ask, I'm going to, I'm going to ask all of us to take some next steps. If you know in your heart you've never trusted Jesus, you never had that moment where you didn't do something, you just said in your heart, Jesus, I need you. I cannot save myself. I cannot do enough, but I know you've done it all on the cross, and I want you to take my place. I want to receive the gift of salvation, and you call on him to forgive your sins and, and to, to save you. If that's never happened to you before, I want you to know today it can happen. I'm going to ask you to do something that will take some courage. It's going to take some boldness. But the payoff is a secure eternity. And so if you are hearing my voice in this room or maybe even in the overflow room, I want you to do something for me right now. If in your heart you feel the gnawing of Jesus, you've been looking for the more, and now you know what that more can be in your life if you would trust Jesus. If you want to leave today knowing for certain that you have life with Jesus Christ in eternity, not based on what you've done, but what he did on the cross, I'm going to ask you to do something right now that will take some courage. I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are. If today you want to know Jesus before you leave this place, you want Jesus as your eternal Savior, I want you to stand up right where you are right now. Amen. Now, don't wait. Don't wait. Amen. Those of you that have your eyes, you can look. Stay seated, but look what God is doing as he is transforming lives right now. Let's give them just an applause of their courage. Now, I'm going to say one more time. we got to move on. I'm just going to say one more time. If you want to know for certain that you have Jesus as your Savior, I want you to stand up. And if you're standing, I'm going to ask for another big step. I know I'm pushing the limits here. But if you're standing, if you look in the aisles, there are some people standing. In fact, raise your hand. These are our ministers. And you know, they just want to talk to you about this. That's all it is. We're not going to get, you know, we're not going to do anything crazy. We just want to talk to you so that you know exactly what's going. Too many people go through life unsure. And you've said that you want Jesus as your Savior. I want you to leave with that certainty. So if you're standing, I want you to make your way out of the aisles. And grab any, it doesn't matter, the closest one to you. Just grab one of these ministers. Just walk straight to them right now. And they're going to lead you off. They're just going to talk to you. And so just step off to the side of the closest one to you. Again, thank you for your courage today. Beloved, there are dozens of people that walked in without Jesus, but they're going to leave with them. Absolutely. Y'all keep coming. Now, those of you still seated, listen to me. Listen to me. We saw earlier some 10 people get baptized. And there are some people, and you know you've trusted Jesus. You, know, you got that one nailed down, locked in, no questions. But the truth is you've never been baptized. Well, why should I? Guess what? Being baptized doesn't make you saved. 
In fact, if you haven't trusted Jesus and you've trusted your baptism, you're trusting the wrong things. That being said, we celebrate baptism at BT because baptism is a step of obedience. It's after you place your faith in Jesus saying, you know what, I've trusted Jesus as my Savior and I don't care if it's 2,000 people or two people, I'm going to make this thing public. And when those people get lowered into the water, it's the symbol of them going into the tomb of Jesus. But they don't stay in the water, do they? No, they come right back up. Symbolic of Jesus walking out of the tomb and the new life Jesus gives us. And so there's a story in the book of Acts where this guy named Philip led this Ethiopian guy to Jesus. This Ethiopian guy confesses Jesus as his savior in Acts chapter eight. And then that guy sees some water. He sees a river, a stream, a pool. I don't know what it was. It just says he saw some water. And he said, why can't I get baptized? And Philip didn't have an answer. He said, there's water, let's do it. And that Ethiopian went and got in the water. He got baptized right after trusting Jesus. And for some of you, you trusted Jesus years ago and that's okay. That's what counts. But you know you haven't been baptized. Guess what? It's a little bit cold, but we got some water. We got t-shirts and towels and shorts. And if we run out of those things, you can just get baptized in your clothes. They dry, I promise. And so I'm going to ask some of you to make another big step here. If you know you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, but you have never been baptized, and this Easter you want to make that public in front of 3,000 or so people, 28, 2,600, I don't know what it is, a bunch of people. And you will say, I don't care because Jesus has saved me and now's the time I'm going to let everybody know that my life is aligned with him. If you want to be baptized today, right now, I need you to stand up. I can't tell. But if you're standing, so I need you to, I need you to come right up here to the front. Ron, wave your, here's Pastor Ron. He's going to talk with you. He's going to help get you squared away. And now I'm going to ask everyone to stand. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. And we're going to worship together. There's some ministers right up here in the front. There's some ministers out in that aisle underneath the risers, in front of the risers. And as we worship, maybe some of you, you've come in here knowing Jesus. You've come in here and you've been baptized. All those things have happened, but you've just kind of been walking through a defeated life and you need some prayer. Maybe it's the marriage, it's the finances, it's the health. Guess what? These men and women want to pray for you today. Maybe you didn't have the courage for whatever reason to, to come forward to trust Jesus. These men and these women, they can tell you about Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you, you were a little bit embarrassed, but you say, you know what, I need to do this step. I need to get baptized. Pastor Ron's still waiting. We can still do it. We still have the water. We got this, all the stuff we need. All I'm asking is this. Every person has a next step. Maybe for some of us, it's to leave here and to make much of Jesus. Maybe it's to, to, to leave here and make some hard decisions. Maybe it's to come forward and receive some prayer. Whatever your next step is, whether it's trusting Jesus, being baptized, getting some prayer for healing and encouragement, whatever your next step is, when we begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to step out and come forward as we worship today a risen Savior. Father, we love you. I'm thankful for the work that you are doing here. I pray you would move in our midst. You would do a powerful work. And God, I pray that all the glory would go to you. It's in Jesus' name.
fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name Oh! 
Thank you, Lord. Your name, your name is victory. All praise. Yes. Only to Christ our King, your name, your name. festivities planned all right we, we got an egg hunt coming up for kiddos but if you'll give us a few more minutes you want to keep celebrating just a little bit more yeah. we've had dozens of people come forward to receive Jesus today and I don't know how many people we got quite a few that want to get baptized you want to watch it all right y'all take a seat pastor Marshall all right thanks pastor Chris well, this is Claudia Vargas, and she is following the Lord in believer's baptism. So, Claudia, what is your profession of faith? To follow the Lord. Amen. Well, if you'll have a seat right there, right. And face that way, sit on that stool. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I know. Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. All right. These guys are okay. All right. This is Mark Rodriguez. Well, Mark, yeah, he's, he's ready. He's got his jeans on and everything. So, Mark, what's your profession of faith? I to follow Jesus and I want people to know. Amen. Have a seat on that. I know it's cold. <laughs> Woo. All right. Well, Mark, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Woo. Yeah. This is Jordan Gonzalez, and he is cold. So Jordan, what is your profession of faith? To follow God's word. Amen. Well, if you'll turn around, have a seat there. Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. These guys.
This is Angel Sanchez. Well, Angel, what is your profession of faith? I have decided to follow Jesus. All right. Well, Angel, if you'll sit on that stool right there. You got it? Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Woo! This way. This is Tyler Guzman, and he's cold too. So, Tyler, what is your profession of faith? Just right up there towards that mic, buddy. Because I have decided to follow Jesus. Woo! Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Leah Castaneda. Well, Leah, what is your profession of faith? Okay, man, bring the mic. What is it? Follow Jesus. All right. Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Geraldine Del Castillo. Well, Geraldine, what is your profession of faith? I've decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Well, you'll sit on that bench. Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, grace to walk in newness of life. Amen. Here, this way. This is Mary Lou Ariano. Well, Mary Lou, what is your profession of faith? Right here. Oh, I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'll sit on that, on that bench right there, yeah. There we go. Now, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. These guys behind me. This is Alex Pequeño. Alex, what is your profession of faith? I have decided to follow Jesus. Amen. <laughs> have a seat there. You'll make it. You can do it. Holy cow. <laughs> Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Woo! You did it. You did it. Arutia? Urutia. Urutia? This is Alyssa Arutia. Alyssa, what is your profession of faith? Uh, Gives you one minute. I've decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Well, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Michelle Esparza. Michelle, what is your profession of faith? I have decided to follow Jesus. All right. Amen. Can you turn around? Have a seat right there. Now, based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Whoop. All right, we have to, we have to rearrange. Okay. This is Elonso Esparza. 
And he also is professing his faith. So what is your profession? I just decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Well, brother, if you'll sit on that, if you'll step on the other side and sit on it, yeah. Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. We got you. We got you. Gabby Guetta? This is Gabby Guetta. Well, Gabby, what is your profession of faith? I've decided to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you'll turn around and sit on that stool. There we go. Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. You can, these guys will help you out. There we go. Yes. This is Sabrina Diaz. And Sabrina, what is your profession of faith? I will follow Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'll sit there, Sabrina, I know it's cold. It's really cold. Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. There you go. It's cold. It's cold. Brisa Garza. Brisa, what is your profession of faith? I decided to follow Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'll be seated there. Based upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my Christian sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. All right. What a celebration, amen? I know uh, we stuck around a little longer than we thought. Thank you for sticking around. I know some people probably had some uh, plans they had to get to, but aren't you glad you stuck around? I didn't even count how many people that was. I mean, dozens of people getting counseled to accept Jesus earlier, 20 or 30 baptisms today. You think we should do it again next year? Me too. Except next year, we're going to get the whole exhibit hall. We only got half of it right now. So next year, we're getting the whole exhibit hall. And we're going to bring all of our plus ones again. If you were a guest with us today at BT Church, I am so very thankful that you came, that you said yes to an invitation. And I hope today that you heard from the living God. I pray you were encouraged. And I pray you leave here knowing more about the God who loves you. Know that you're welcome to join us next week. We do this every week, not here, but in two locations. We're in McAllen in 2001 Trenton between 10th and uh, 23rd, basically, 6 p.m. Saturday night, 9 a.m. Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Sunday. We're also in Sherryland at the Hawthorne Suites just off the expressway, just past Sherry Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. and 11 p.m. We would love to have all of our guests join us back next week for worship at one of our two locations. Again, so thankful that you came. BT, amazing job bringing the plus ones. Amen. We do have one last bit of festivities today. We have 5,000 Easter eggs for all the kiddos. And so as we leave in just a moment, just so you know what to expect, when you walk out the main doors, to your left will be a hunt specifically for two-year-olds through pre-K. And the right side of the big pond, there'll be an egg hunt for elementary, kinder, through fifth. It won't take long. We're not going to keep you, let you get to all the rest of your day. But before we leave today, if you're new to BT, we've been trusting God to do a new thing, and he's been doing it. He's been doing a new thing. This has been talked about for years, coming together, the whole church, to celebrate. We had 2,500 plus seats in this room, another 170 plus, I think, in our overflow room, and we had people standing up in both places. I don't know what that is. That's 2,800, 3,000 people. And so he's doing a new thing. He's going to keep doing a new thing. And so I'm going to ask you to stand as we get ready to head out. And we're going to continue to trust God with Isaiah 43, 19, the, the new thing that he's doing. Help me out. It'll be on the screen. Here we go. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness 
and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43, 19. And as we go out today, I thank you so much for being here, for sticking around late with us. And this is my prayer for each of you as you go today. I pray that our great God, the resurrected King of glory, I pray that he would bless and keep you today. And I pray that he would make his face shine upon you and that he would be so gracious to you. I pray as you go through the rest of your day today and all of next week, he would remind you of his friendship as his countenance falls over you. And as you go out today, trusting Jesus, making much of him, and until we gather and celebrate him again next Sunday, I pray that our great God would guard your heart and your mind with his peace that passes understanding. You are truly loved, and you are dismissed.